Uh, thanks everyone for investing this uh, Saturday morning time with us. Uh, so I don't want to, I just want to talk on the basis of truth. I want to be myself today. I want to remove all the masks that I have to wear when I'm in hospital, when I'm with patients, when I'm talking to people who are dying of cancer, because I want to make this time efficient for me as well as, you know, a value add for you. So I want to start off by saying that, you know, motivation is not what keeps us going. You know, a lot of us think that we need to be inspired and motivated all the time to, be, to keep going. But motivation and inspiration has a life. You know, we can watch one motivational video, be motivated for one day. After that, we need the next video and the next and the next. It's a good to have, but it's not the essence of success in anything that we do. We need to understand at some point, we have to be self-motivated. It comes from within us. You know, we don't need someone to tell us that we need to exercise every day. We don't need someone to constantly motivate us to sleep better or to meditate or to grow our careers. Okay, that becomes a desire that you truly want. And I think in my entire career today, whoever I am, I mean, a lot of people call me different things. You know, I still call myself uh, Luke and I still live my life in wonder. Okay, what I am today, I never had a plan. I never created it. Life created it for me when I started to align my true desire and my vision with life. It's as simple as that. I can use the next 35 and 40 minutes to, you know, kind of uh, show off to you all the business aspects and talk about PNLs and, you know, uh, how we made a million dollars in five months, you know, after tax and all of that stuff. But I'm not here to show you that. I'm here to talk about my truth, which a lot of people may not relate to, but it's my truth. And like I always say, you know, we can have role models. I'm, I'm never a person who's had a role model because if, if I choose a role model, that means I only look at life in that one perception of that one role model. But that, it's that one person's life. You know? I want to look at dynamic lives and you know, situations around the world. And I want to take the best from maybe 100 role models, you know, learnings from 100 different mentors, and then make my own learning out of it and translate it into action. So like I said, I never really, you know, uh, never had a plan to move into this. You know, my childhood was pretty simple. You know, I wasn't the best student in class. I was really poor in math. I was poor in science, but yet I passed out in, from an ICSE school with a distinction. So I was like, okay, let's try science in the 11th and 12th. So I did CBSE science 11th, 12th, completely hated it, managed to pass it with a first class. And then I decided to move into arts and just fool around because arts was the easiest subject. I was in St. Xavier's and Goa. You know, so you know how to go. Our life was at that point. It was a whole hippie life. And I got into DJing and I just loved my life. And then at some point, my dad said, it's time to be serious. What do you really want to do? My best friend's dad was the general manager of the Taj. And we used to spend weekends there because, you know, he was my best friend. And we would get all the free food and free rooms and, you know, use the pool and tennis courts. And so when my dad asked me, I had absolutely no clue. I just said, I want to be the general manager of a hotel because I thought if you're the general manager of a hotel, you get all those perks and everything that comes along with it. So I said, okay, I want to do hotel management. So my dad got me into IHM and I joined IHM. And on the first day, I hated it. But I didn't have the heart to tell my dad because at that point, the fees were really high. And my dad had retired a long time ago. So I didn't have the heart to tell him. I said, let me just push myself through three years. There were 18 subjects. Out of that, there was just one subject that I truly loved, and it was food science and nutrition. And uh, I put a lot of effort into that subject. I continued DJing on the weekend nights. That, that time in Goa, it was the whole hippie scene, very different from today. So uh, we did a lot of DJing. We had a lot of parties. It was the whole rave scene. And I got through my three years of college. We had campus interviews. McDonald's had just opened in India. They came with this whole management program for six months where you become a manager in six months. So I said, oh, wow, that sounds good. Let me get out of Goa, move to Mumbai. So went to McDonald's for the first six months, only got to clean toilets, make burgers, sell burgers, absolutely zero regrets. After six months, it was a stipend of 500 rupees a month. Living in Bombay, even, even uh, that would have been, been about 20 years ago, maybe. Yeah, maybe about 18 years ago. It was not enough, but, you know, I was blessed. My mom had a little house in Bandra and my mom's brother allowed me to use it so I didn't have to pay rent. So you lived on 500. I ate all my meals at McDonald's and all of that stuff so I wouldn't have to spend money on food. Okay. Uh, up front, I don't have a rags to riches story. You know, it's, I've had a good childhood. My parents were good. They spent money on us. They had enough to give us a great life. But coming to Bombay was a completely different experience. 
At that time, it was also the boom of call centers. So one day we saw this ad where you can earn 8,000 a month. So it was a no brainer. Quit McDonald's, joined a call center, didn't even know what it was and uh, worked there for about a year, year and a half. Had an interview for a call center in Dubai, took it, cracked it, joined Dubai as a team leader. So I think so for the first five years in my life, I just moved from one job to another, never, want, never knowing what I wanted. I think a huge part of my success today is my dad always told me one thing, whatever it is that you do in life, as long as it makes you happy and as long as it's ethical. He's saying, I don't care what success you have as long as it makes you happy. And I think that's played a massive role in what I did. The first five years, traveled around the UK, Qatar, changing jobs, moving to higher pace from insurance to call centers to hospitality. And then I finally came back down to India and I joined IBM. I was with IBM for about 10 years, got into operations, moving to leadership management, you know, all different things. And I continued studying health. It was always fascinating. Anatomy, I kept doing all my courses with different institutes around the world. At a point in my career, I think it was my seventh year in IBM. As I grew, I was a senior uh, manager over there, cushy job, lots of travel, everything good. I started, you know, you see, you have more exposure to the VPs and the CEOs of the company. Okay. And I started noticing how most of them had health problems. And, you know, you would always envy the life of the CEO, the VP, they get to travel business class, one country to another, and they would come back and they would be complaining about their back pain and how they can't sit comfortably in a flight because of their back pain. Most of them had cholesterol issues. Uh, IBM had something called integrated health services. So I asked to participate in that as an extra kind of a job role where I got involved in, you know, health, health at a CEO level, health at a VP level, health at a company level. I really enjoyed that because I think that was my calling. I started to see a lot of patients privately in, in IBM itself, helping people with their health problems. And then one fine day, we had this one particular VP and he was, he was overweight and he couldn't even fit into the business class seat of a flight. That's when something really hit me. And I was like, you know, something's not wrong. You have success at a career level. You have money. You have a fantastic package. You have power in the company, but you can't enjoy it. Half the time you're at the doctor working out with your cholesterol levels. The statins are creating side effects. You have muscle spasms all the time. And that's when I said, you know, this is a gap I want to fill. I was still in IBM. I said, I want to fill this gap. You know, it can't be that there's so much of medicine and technology and so many, so many gyms and superfoods and nutritionists, but yet people are chronically sick. They're not getting better completely. You know, five people at a CEO level are on three to four different drugs at the same time. One for their BP, one for their cholesterol, one for sleep. And I said, this is a gap I want to fill. So you come to that juncture in your life where you need to make a decision now, give up a job, a highly paying job with a lot of travel, a lot of respect, a cushy job, easy money, and you need to move into starting your own practice. Uh, it took me a month to make that decision, the most difficult decision in my life. You know, I had thoughts of, you know, I can see 20 patients and work, you know, because IBM had this beautiful policy where as long as there's no conflict with what you do, you can do that. We had practicing psychiatrists who were also employees of IBM running their full-fledged practices. It was beautiful. And so I started doing that. I had 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 patients. Then I had to make a decision in order to be fair to either one, IBM or my patients. So I made that decision in one night and that was the best decision of my life. The best decision. It came with so much of fear, but I was able to focus on all of my patients after that. Now I had a new problem. Okay, no one knows who Lou Coutinho is. They know me as a senior manager from IBM, learning and development, operations, accounts, and all of that stuff. I had to create a whole new identity. So I had about 20 patients and, you know, at one point I even stopped charging people because, you know, I was in the phase of being a people pleaser, you know, where you try to be good so people are good back to you and maybe they just say, hey, there's this guy, Luke, who helped me with my health. So I started doing that. I, I, I would do free consults for about two, three months. And then I started getting busy and busier. So I started charging 500 bucks for a consult and looking after their health for a month. Uh, I used to do hospital rounds in the morning and then one fine day, uh, I was in Bandra and I was supposed to head to Just Lok Hospital for my rounds. And there was a patient who was supposed to meet me in Just Lok, but he was stuck in traffic at BKC. So he called me up and he said, I, I won't be able to make it in time. So I said, come to Bandra. I looked around. It was a cafe, brew cafe. It was a coffee shop. And I said, I'm outside this cafe. If you don't mind, I'll meet you at the cafe. So he said, that works for me. 
we met at a cafe and we had a one hour consult. And the next day he sent me a message saying, Luke, when I meet you in hospital, it's different. When I meet you in a cafe, it's just different. It's, you know, I could express myself, talk to you more. You know, I was more at ease. And then something struck me. I said, let me start meeting people in a coffee shop, you know, because I don't have to really do physical checkups in my kind of role. So uh, I started meeting people in coffee shops and people loved it, chatting about their health over coffee, you know, taking them through their nutrition, their medical reports. It was just beautiful. Soon we had lines of people waiting outside the coffee shop and it was crazy. We had celebrities coming to the coffee shop to meet us because I didn't have the time to move out of the coffee shop. I had so many people. So life started teaching me, you know, a very different perspective. My first thing was raise capital, make a clinic, rent a clinic, do all of that stuff. But I never had to do it because a new model got grown out of that one experience of having a patient meet me outside rather than in a hospital. So I actually started off my practice in a coffee shop. Okay. I started traveling to New York, Belgium, London. That's where I had most of my clients. And I did the same thing. I would meet everyone in coffee shops and people loved it. Hospital rounds happened in hospitals. Okay. So I never really had the overhead of a clinic or anything like that. Everyone knew that I'm going to meet Luke in a coffee shop in Tokyo or here. And it became a very exciting kind of a thing because people felt they were not pressurized with the whole hospital scenario and stuff like that. So that at that point in my life, I realized that I don't have to do this. So from coffee shops, I moved to five-star hotels for more high-profile people, for you know, uh, celebrities and stuff like that. I would probably do home visits at a different cost. But this whole business model built out of itself. At that time, I joined Vishal Gondal. He's the CEO and my co-founder as well. He's the actual founder of Goki. I joined him as a co-founder as well. And I would help to build the whole nutritional aspect and the customer uh, uh, healthcare system in Goki. I finished my job then. I told Vishal, I can't continue right now because I have too many patients. And uh, I never thought this would become my business. This is my actual story. You know, a lot of people think that, hey, Luke, you're an amazing businessman. You're an entrepreneur. You built your business from one client to like a thousand people a month with a massive wait list. I never did this. One fine day, I got so fed up of seeing my patients because every second patient had the same problem, acidity, bloating, constipation. And because of that, they had bigger problems, diabetes, cardiac issues, and all of that stuff. One fine day, I saw this feature on Facebook, Facebook Live. And I just said, let me go live and teach people how to manage acidity and constipation. These are things that people should not have to pay for. They should know it. Half of India lives with these problems thinking it's okay but it is the root cause of every deadly disease. Today, we know that acidity plays a huge role in cancers. We know that acidity plays a new role, uh, a massive role in Alzheimer's, in digestive issues and all of that stuff. But people are only symptomatically treating that. So I went live on Facebook. I had one viewer. The next day I went live on constipation. I had a couple of you know, trolling comments and stuff. But I felt good because I got one comment the next night saying, hey, Luke, I tried your remedies and my acidity disappeared. I was motivated. I started going live every day with one vision that the line of my patients, okay, reduces with those queries. And I really only handle complicated cases that are meant to like cancers or heart attacks and stuff like that. I said, let me educate people on the basics. So it's been four years since I went Facebook live with the intention to share information. And if my truth is ever, I'm not a good businessman. I don't understand business. I can't even read an Excel sheet. I don't even know what a PNL is. Okay. The vision of sharing has built a multi-million dollar business for us in the last three years. I just went out there and shared. I can sit here to you and fool you and try to tell you that, oh, I studied a lot and I did this. No, I studied moderately, okay? But I think for me, my success was the vision to share, the vision that people should not get sick with things that they can control. That was my true vision. A lot of people said, Luke, you're stupid. You're giving away the tricks of the trade. You know, why will people come to you? But in my mind was there are always going to be sick people. It was never a threat. So my entire success in business has been built out of sharing. Within four months of starting the Facebook lives, I had to have a team. I had 20 doctors. I had 20 nutritionists. I couldn't understand finance. One day, the person who would manage my finance said, hey, Luke, you've made a million dollars in five months after tax. He said, you need to really put some serious thought into, you know, putting the loose ends together. Okay. I'm sharing the number with you not to show off because a million dollars is really small. I'm putting it, I'm putting that number to show you what can happen in five months without any focus on chasing the number, but only on chasing the dream. So I went and found the CFO. 
because I don't know how to make, uh, understand a PNL. I don't know how to understand accounts. And I figured I don't want to try to become an entrepreneur because I want to focus on what has created that million dollars in five months, which is being out there with my patients, being effective. So I hired a CFO, I hired a team of people that could do everything that I couldn't do. Okay. We started spending almost like 10 to 15 lakhs a month just on that headcount. But it was brilliant. It was a brilliant move. A lot of people said, look, if you can do five of these things, you can do 10 of these things. Why do you need to increase your headcount? But I always reminded myself of the fact that what made your first million dollars in five months was you doing X, Y, Z. Don't ever change the X, Y, Z. Continue doing that. Just continue doing that. So I started hiring more people who could do what I couldn't do. And today we've built a, you know, a little business. You know, we have a fantastic valuation. We have you know, 100 plus medical doctors around the world, nutritionists, dietitians, yoga therapists, like you name it. We're affiliated with hospitals across the world. And this was not even a plan. When my CFO said, what's, what's your vision? Honestly, till date, my vision's never, ever changed. I don't chase the number. I never chased the number and it came to me. So I have belief that if I'm effective with every patient, I don't want to be the best. It's very easy to be the best. We can have large marketing budgets. I can hire social media teams, marketing companies, and their job is to make me the best. And they will do it with 10 crore budget, budgets, 15 crore budgets. They can do it. But that's not how we made our first million dollars. We made it by being effective, by delivering results, by getting people off their cholesterol medication or showing them that they can reduce it, by getting people's cancers into a better stage, working with their doctors. So for me till date, if you ask me, my success point has always been sharing, giving back. I'm a hundred percent strong believer on the more we give without expectation, the more we get. And two, being effective, not being the best. I believe that when we are effective, so a lot of people call me a celebrity nutritionist and I hate that. You know, I guess the media terms you on the way that drives their own ratings and stuff like that. But for me, it's very limiting. It's very devaluing, you know? Because I'm not a celebrity nutritionist. We treat everyone else and you don't have to be famous to be good. You have to be effective. And when you're effective, the fame automatically follows. So we released bestsellers. They became bestsellers because we put everything into the book. We didn't write a book and say, come onto our website and buy this product. We put every single bit of information that's healing people in our practices into the book. So they became bestsellers in less than a month. And I guess, you know, honestly, that's my story. I don't see this as work. It's my passion. I can't even go through a day without consulting with someone. It gives me my sense of worth. It is my life purpose. I encourage people always to try to find your life purpose. And it doesn't have to be something dramatic. You know, we've helped housewives find their life purposes of actually being a housewife, but a damn good housewife where they can give their time to their kids, feel proud of what they do, support their families. And all of a sudden they stop looking for their life purpose because they realize that is their life purpose. So, you know, we've been trying to simplify things that people have made complicated, you know, things that people run off to the mountains to find peace. We try to help them to find peace right now in their life, in the middle of Mumbai city, in the middle of Delhi, in the middle of New York city, because it's all within us. So I think my whole practice has really been formed. I take a lot away from the books I've learned, maybe 1% of knowledge from books, 99% from experience, realizing that everyone is individual. There is no one human being who's the same. If you have a headache, a protocol for you will be different, different from 10 people who have a headache because we're individual and there's so much more than a symptom. So I think that vision of filling the gap between chronic illness and a symptomatic approach is what brought us success. No one was doing it. And everyone said, Luke, there's never going to be money in what you do, which is lifestyle. The money is in giving the medication. The money is in selling the nutrition plans and the weight loss plans. But at some point in my life, I felt you can, everyone knows you need to eat well. You know what you need to eat. Everyone knows that you need to sleep well, exercise, look after your emotional wellness. We all know it. The problem is people's lifestyles. Your lifestyles don't allow you to do it. We don't have respect for time. We allow time to eat into our basic fundamentals of sleep. We allow time to rob us that 30 minutes of exercise. We allow time to rob us our meal timings. We allow time and business and money to control the quality of food that we eat. So what people really needed and need right now is lifestyle. And all the money in the future is going to be in lifestyle. Because you know what we realized through the COVID? You know, a certain amount of the population of the world has realized suddenly that, the, you know, pills and medicines have its limitations. There was nothing that could come to help with this virus. But what did the world start talking about? Immunity, turmeric, 
exercise, better sleep, vitamin D3, things that we've always known, but they were never in the limelight because they didn't bring in the cash. So today people are realizing that if you don't change your lifestyle, it doesn't matter if you're a CEO, a billionaire, an actor or an actress or whatever wealth you have in your bank account. Okay, you have finite time and finite life and your health will rob you of that if you don't look after it. So our entire business model today, my entire passion revolves around helping people make simple lifestyle changes. Yes, we are expensive because my time is expensive. It's valuable. But if you look at the world today, they're spending money on changing their lifestyles. People want to know how to sleep better. People want to know how to eat better. People want to know you know, what kind of exercises suit them. People want to know how to find their peace of mind. You know, today, when you look at today's world and, you know, we don't have to convince anyone that lifestyle is a medicine. You can look at it as statistics around you. Okay, we have so much more technology. We have so much more wealth, comfort, nutritionists, doctors, all of that stuff. But we are at the highest count when it comes to statistical numbers of suicides, depressions, divorces, affairs, unhappy marriages, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, teenage deaths and suicides, unhappy children, depression. Okay, something's wrong. Something's wrong in a world where we have more, where we think we are so entitled to more, obviously it's not right for our health. And that is where we are trying to encourage and coach people to make the change of lifestyle. The most camp complicated cancer case that comes to us requires the most simplest lifestyle changes. Over and above that, you take your chemo, your radiation, whatever. A type two diabetic today, the world, the media, unfortunately, it's not the fault of people like you and me. The world, the medical world, social media, the nutrition world have taught people that, oh, diabetes, as long as you're on a drug and your levels are controlled, you're okay, but you're not okay. You still have diabetes, you're still a patient, that's gonna affect your kidneys, your pressure, your brain, the quality of your life. So we're trying to educate people by making them understand that it is our innate physiology to be of good health. It is our innate physiology to be happy. So when we're constantly struggling to be happy, we have a big problem in our world. Like I said, all the amount of comfort or wealth or position that we have today, people are still unfulfilled. They still feel empty inside. They still feel that they need more and more. When do we say enough is enough? When we feel fulfilled. But today, no one knows when enough is enough because we don't have that feeling of fulfillment. So you see, health today is no longer just about weight loss. It's no longer just about keeping your cholesterol levels down. It's honestly about how you feel at the end of the day. Do you feel energetic or do you have to wake up the cup of coffee after coffee after coffee? Do you have to punish your body with crazy exercise just to be healthy? Do you have to punish your body with extreme fat diets? The answer is no, something's wrong. These are cries of help from your body. Trying to tell you, slow down. I don't need complication. I need simplicity. Most of the most complicated problems today are solved with simplicity. With simplicity. Right now, I can tell you, we reverse hundreds and thousands of people's diabetes. Yes, type 2 diabetes is reversible. Not because Luke is saying it. It is reversible because the condition and nature of the disease is reversible if you do the right things. So you take your medication, you change your lifestyle, you eat better, you sleep on time, your levels come down, your doctor gets you off your medication. Guess what? Type 2 diabetes reverse. The same thing with your thyroid. There's no magic drug, there's no magic food, there's no magic anything that exists. It is your lifestyle. If your lifestyle has brought on disease, it is your lifestyle that will change it or has the ability to change it. So in short, that's our success story till date. I don't know what my PNL is. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. People say, oh, wow, Luke, you must be doing really well and stuff like that for me. I don't have a financial goal. I visualize abundance. For me, it's very simple. I want to be able to do what I want whenever I want without a struggle. That's abundance for me. So whether I want to travel exotically to an exotic location, whether I want to give the best to my family, my kids, my parents, if I want to make, to make that decision today, I'm able to do it. That is abundance for me. A number won't fix that for me. A couple of million dollars won't fix that for me. A couple of billion dollars won't fix that for me. So I think these are very superficial goals. That's for me. Someone else may have that goal and that's your story. Remember what I said, everyone's different. For me, it's abundance. I don't have to care about how well my company is doing as long as I can pay my staff, 
be effective with my patients, help everyone grow, help every one of my employees to have the life that I strive for, which is comfort, being able to give the best to our families, have a comfortable life, give back to society. That's our goal. It's as simple as that. So I don't really chase a number. I chase effectiveness. I chase effectiveness. Every patient who comes to us, if we are able to touch their lives, bring down their disease, give them back quality life or health, I'm effective. We've never marketed. In fact, a lot of you will not even know me because you'll never see an ad of Lucatino. You'll see a lot of social media because why should we market when word of mouth is our best marketing? We heal one patient. They're going to tell 10, 15, 20, a thousand people. And that's why we never have to market. So this is my success story in short, very different from the corporate world. Very, very different from the corporate world. Am I smart? Did I learn this? No, I believe life put me on this path because everything that I thought I never liked in my life, any regret happened to actually be the learning that I've learned from. There was a time in IBM and I'll share the story with you. Okay. That actually gave me the courage to decide that I never want to succeed in the corporate world. Again, this is my story. Okay. We used to get all these pep talks from all of our CEOs and our VPs that, oh, we're a family, attrition. At that time, attrition was huge. We should not attract. We should make sure our, our team members don't attract. We are a family together, a family. And I used to believe in that and feel so good about that. The same VP who gave us that talk 10 days later, she quit and joined another multinational company as a senior VP. And I felt let down. I said, you know, you can't fool people and talk about us being a family when you yourself don't lead that. That's when I realized to me, my lesson, my lesson, I'm not preaching for other people, that there's a certain amount of hypocrisy in the corporate world where I guess I'm not against it. You got to do what you got to do to run the business. I never wanted to be part of that. Never. So I decided that anything that I get into will always be run in a very different way. I will pay my people differently. If I grow, they grow. If I grow richer, they grow richer. So I moved on to a variable model. I never moved on to a fixed employee model at all because that was limiting to for them, but very profitable for my company. So today, if I have a thousand patients and I have a hundred nutritionists, every time I get paid, my nutritionists also earn. And that today has kept us absolutely successful. I don't worry about attrition. I don't have to worry about loyalty. People who genuinely, genuinely want to move on will move on and we let them go because obviously they're less on passion at that point. But all the issues that corporates would have my corporate would have when I was working with it, struggling to keep attrition, struggling to keep people happy. I felt it could be done differently if I kept people part of my growth story, which means if I grow, go. If I'm able to afford a house today, I want my team under me to be able to afford houses. And my team today, most of them have bought their own houses and their cars working with us. So for me today, I'm absolutely proud with the way we work. We have a very simple business model. We're debt free. We don't have a loan from the bank. We're not open to investors because we like to reinvest our own profits and grow our business. We can be maybe a 3000 crore valuation company right now if we open it up to people, but we don't want to get into that game. We're happy where we are right now. And we've grown to a hundred million dollar valuation doing what we've been doing for the last current, uh, you know, for the last three and a half years. And we have absolutely no need to change that at that particular point. So like Deepak said at the start, we just want you to be honest about your story. And this is my story. We don't have any fancy MBAs on our team. Not that I'm against MBAs. We've tried to keep it simple because the first three months, the first five months where we built a million dollars without even striving for it, that was my success story. I go back to those five months. What were we doing? Let me do that. Let me continue to do that. And now add on all the other resources that you need so that you can grow. You can also grow financially, business-wise and everything else. So in truth, what can I say? A lot of people say, hey, Luke, you know, what does it take to live your dream? I am living my dream. I'm living my dream on all fronts. It doesn't mean it doesn't come with ups and downs. Yes, there are massive failures when our patients die. It's a huge failure for all of us, which we learn to detach. We learn so many new things. Every day our practice reminds us that our parents are going to die someday. Our children are going to die. We're going to die. You know, it's not an easy job, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It grounds us. It makes us see between the hypocrisy in the business world and the corporate world between what the real world is. And we try to share our learnings from our dying patients with the world out there that keep it simple, aspire, grow wealthy, have everything, but never lose your inner connection. Never lose the essence of living life. Before I end and hand it over back to Deepak, I'll tell you why, where these lessons come from, not from a book. 
I speak to my dying patients. Every single day, we have patients who are dying, fourth stage, end of life patients. Let me tell you what my dying patients talk about. They never talk about who they were, whether they were actors, CEOs, VPs. They never talk about how much money they made. They never talk about the power they had in their life. They talk about lost love, regrets. They talk about their children. They talk about their family. They talk about memories that they suddenly start remembering through their life. This is the essence of life. If this is what we're going to be talking about on our deathbeds or what becomes important, we need to make it important right now. And you can do that. You can simplify your life and still be a fantastic CEO, a wealthy billionaire, whatever it takes, but keep the balance. Don't let one un create an unbalance in your life, which leaves you with regret that no money or no power or fame can ever, ever fill that void up.